Okay, so Wilson, where where's Hedgehog based? Because we were talking about remote work and the nature of what you do. Mm-hmm. You can't grow you, your product remotely. You got to no, look it's not after it a, and care uh, for it. Great option for us, so to speak. So you're, yeah, mus- in, you're in the mushroom business. We're in the mushroom business, uh, and so our headquarters right now is in San Francisco, uh, and we're looking to open our first uh, our next facility in uh, near Denver in Colorado. Okay, and what does it take to grow mushrooms? <laughs> That's a good question, and so, we should tell everyone like. We're not talking about the mushrooms that make you see the Grateful Dead or yeah, talk yeah, to Yeah, that's talk a, inevitably to, the first question. Yeah, talk to the sun like, god. So what <laughs> kind of mushrooms are you growing? It's like right. none of that. Like shiitake, oyster mushrooms. Like right. We're starting with specialty mushrooms that are still like food mushrooms. Okay. Would you consider these to be fancy mushrooms? Yeah, and that's a that's a big premise of what we're trying to do is like right now they're pretty expensive to buy all of those mushrooms and it's theoretically possible to make them much cheaper. And so we're kind of one of the taglines is like effectively go from Whole Foods to Walmart with those ah, kinds of mushrooms. You know, everybody, just in case, you know, everyone thinks I'm secretly a mushroom expert. I am not. I know absolutely nothing about how mushrooms are. Or like fancy mushrooms, you have to go out and find them? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a big difference there. Is there's, there's foraged mushrooms and then there's cultivatable mushrooms. And the okay. foraged ones are called like mycorrhizal usually. And that means that they have symbiotic relationships with something in nature right. that we are not smart enough yet as humans to like replicate in a lab. Uh-huh. But like shiitake or oyster, those those you can grow uh, like you could grow kind of in your backyard if you okay. know what you're doing. OK, which most people don't. Right. But there are a lot of hobbyist growers out there. Um, okay. And that's so like that's the thing you can do. Like you can buy blocks that are kind of pre-prepared and then you can grow them yourself if you want. We're looking at a lot of that like really fundamental like production side from the very get go of like what are the inputs turn those into the thing that it needs to be and in volume and quality. Yeah. It's like maintaining quality, jacking up the volume, making it much more accessible. Like I said, basically dropping the, the price down. Right. Now. Your background is in physics and computer science and engineering, and you're the mushroom man. <laughs> Much now. of those things, how, yeah. <laughs> how the f did that happen? Right. So, I mean, it's kind of an interesting progression. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I did my PhD uh, at Stanford in in robotics, and that's not typically the path to being a mushroom farmer. A, a mushroom farmer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but usually, so, the mushroom farmer has taken a wrong turn somewhere. <laughs> and it looks like you've, you know, you sound pretty good on paper. Well, a lot a of times farmer. they start with the other kind of mushroom, and then they're like, oh, ah, yeah. I see, I see, um, the Steve Jobs approach. Yes, yes, yeah. There's <laughs> lots of ways to get there. Um, but in essence, so I, more specifically, when I was doing my PhD, I was building robotic hands mm. um, and at the biomedics and dexterous manipulation lab. Uh, and that was the dexterous manipulation side. It's effectively okay. like, how do you make robots like physically interact with the world, grab things, move things, uh-huh. interact with things in a really physical nature? Because and I got excited about that because like in essence our like computer vision is getting way better and these other robo- right. robotic systems are getting way better. But when it comes to like physically touching things mm-hmm. like robots are still really bad at that. Where they just like they're like shake your hand and pull your arm off. Right. right. And it's like, like that. God damn it, they'll robot. Like, shake your hand and they don't really know if they're shaking your hand because there aren't sensors there. And like okay. then they would try and grab something that's irregularly shaped and it's not a perfect like square or sphere. And right. they're like, ah, right. Um, so they grab, really your, they grab your rear end and it's yeah. an awkward moment with a robot that you've just yeah, met. And it's like, oh, that's a little, <laughs> little like, bit more than I expected. <laughs> <laughs> this robot's got some uh, hand, is yeah, very hand grabby out there. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we, of course, you know, always run that risk. Um, but yeah, so I mean, one of the things that are out there that's a very irregularly shaped object that's fragile and difficult to manipulate is, is kind of these agricultural products more right. broadly. And so one of my last publications, we kind of made the argument that Oh, this this hand, which I had made, uh, would be really good for grasping gentle, um, kind of deformable, squishy things like okay. a fruit or something else that uh-huh. would be from an agricultural harvesting zone. Right. And there's this become this big zone online or coming online of robotics and some amazing companies out there doing stuff here where it's like effectively robotic harvesting of different produce objects, because that's a big uh-huh. part of the, the cost of a lot of these industries. Yeah, you got to get people out to s- pull the things off the Right. Fine, right. <laughs> exactly. So I started looking at like, well, what are all the things that like with my kind of specific skill set there that I could get involved in on agriculture? And I've okay. always been kind of passionate about agriculture. It's a really cool zone for me. Okay. Um, like I grew up in rural Virginia in a pretty small town. OK, so you um, have the, you've seen this. This is part of your story. Yeah. And there weren't really any mushrooms there. We were more cow town. But okay. my uh, my mom always made fun of me because like the third word I ever spoke was tractor. Damn, and, dude, that's <laughs> badass. Yeah. And so I feel like it's kind of ironic that now I've somehow circled back around to making like the tractors of the 22nd century, 21st century. So was were, were mushrooms the first stop or did you go to grapes or did you go to 
yeah, so corn or I guess corn's a bad. When I went down, started going down that path, uh-huh. I looked at a lot of stuff. I was actually really looking at like melons for a while because they're uh-huh. like they're the way they're harvested right now is kind of a nice wild. melon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> nice melon. Coming back to the that yes, the very of, of parts of humans what right. might be similar, but. The, um, We're not suggesting Italian people are behind this type of robotic <laughs> grabbing, but you know, yeah, I'm Italian, exactly. so I can. Say, <laughs> yeah, you can say that. I can say it. Okay, yeah, uh, and you kind so, of agreed with me too, but w- w- we can have that part edited out. Yeah, half my family's <laughs> Italian, so I can. Yeah, you're fine. kind of you're agree. fine. You're fine. Um, anyway, so I was looking at a lot of things, but I wasn't that grounded in the in that sphere as a whole, and that's really where my co-founder came in. Uh, Jamie had like kind of dedicated his whole career up until we met in the ag tech sector. Okay. Uh, he worked at ag tech startup. He, uh, when he was at McKinsey, like really focused on agricultural uh, consulting, like okay. things there. And he had this really broad viewpoint of like what's going on in the landscape. What are the big problems? What are the other things that don't matter as much? And how do you really start to like move the lever um, or move the needle? And in when we met, uh, we actually were like pursuing a couple of different ideas, but he was really the one who brought like, well, we, we should really look at mushrooms. There's a lot going on there, um, for a lot of different reasons, but it was him that kind of kicked us in, in that direction. In the mushroom yeah. direction. Well, that's a beautiful partnership, right? You've got a yeah. guy that's boots on the ground. That's seeing how product is moving, what's difficult, what's expensive, <laughs> where margins are, you know, and he say, Hey, you know, you're, what's the scene from the movie? You ever see the movie Blow where he's in prison? No. He's like, perhaps you had the wrong dream. Have you ever heard of cocaine? <laughs> it's like, he, your buddy's like, have perhaps you, ever heard you had, of mushrooms? have you ever heard of mushrooms? <laughs> yeah. Forget yeah. about this melon that you love so much. A little melon and prosciutto. Yeah. We'll try something else. We'll try something else. That'll be a bit more profitable. Yeah. So you have this cool video on your site um, where you're showing the robotic harvesting Mm -hmm. of the mushrooms and and these mushrooms look like they're the most complicated beautiful things i've ever seen yeah they're wild they're like alien looking things when you really get to a lot of the varieties wow and this is something that for me it was the first time i'd ever seen mushrooms that looked like this Mm, i I haven't been in the forest too long and uh (laughs) anytime i'm in a forest i'm like i gotta get out of here i don't know why i'm in this forest i gotta get out of the fucking forest (laughs) not a lot of those around miami right now not too many forests exactly yeah no you're um no yeah you're 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 if you're lost in Miami it's you know it's not a forest yeah <laughs> yeah so those are oyster <laughs> mushrooms and those they, they come in a ton of different varieties and they have like wild colors and weird shapes they, and, and, and they like kind of like flare out too and yeah and they grow these big clusters which is why we were doing those at the time okay. it made it a lot easier to kind of choose we're going to harvest this one versus this one because okay. we're also working towards shiitake and other things that have different dynamics right when I was a little kid instead of saying uh, the S word, we would say shiitake, and mm, our parents that's could nice. yell at us. Yeah, yeah. That's my closest thing. It was like, to... instead of fart, we would say fluff. That right. Like that. <laughs> that's some Virginia like, so, uh, right you're like so inoffensive. <laughs> you're like, oh, I've escaped ridicule by saying yeah, the word fluff. Yeah, totally escaped ridicule. <laughs> that would never happen to you as a child. So you've, you've number one, like, I, I can't even imagine what the facility looks like that you have to build to pull off a... a shroom operation such as this what what does it look like are you in like a big like metal where like amazon style warehouse with shelving and and various mushrooms growing upon <laughs> said shelves yeah like, so, i mean good question so i think one of the important things that to go into that is effectively like how is it currently done versus how we're trying to do it okay and basically right now most of these mushroom varieties are grown in these small plastic bags and so you have like shelves with just like thousands of plastic bags or plastic bottles okay which you can see has like obvious inefficiencies of just like one there's a bunch of plastic there but uh. kind of more importantly once you bring things down into these small units it's really hard to do a like bulk operation to any of them so you end up with a lot right. of manual labor as to like you have to move the things around and you have to manually harvest them and all that stuff and if you compare that to like a corn combine which is blast <laughs> through the field and just harvest like ton literal tons of corn like right in, in minutes is like you just obviously can't compete with that right uh-huh. so we're trying to take it from that kind of system to we have our own sort of novel architecture that's gonna in essence allow a much more bulk process okay and so getting yeah. at that is yeah like large warehouse describe so because mushrooms are are, fun, are finicky little things right because a corn it's like all right just the corn's just gonna stay where it is it's like a mushroom the spores are cross jumping in other people's spaces sorry i don't know the, yeah the, that, the scientific dropping way. that mushroom terminology yeah i know you could feel you could feel the energy <laughs> the spores are hopping here. and <laughs> yeah but it's it's from what i know which is very little it is really hard to contain the spore. There's spores in this room right now mm-hmm. trying to 
b- po- probably drew, grow a mushroom in this little plant <laughs> here, right? Yeah. Have you ever been to someone's home office and they have a little plant and you look down, there's a mushroom? You're like, no, mushrooms are trying to grow everywhere. Yeah, they're all over the place. Um, yeah, no, I mean, this is a, a really good point. And the way I kind of put it is that mushrooms are in some ways much more finicky to grow than plants because of this kind of broad contamination issue. Right. Uh, which means like other things are trying to grow in it. It's not that they're poisonous because they're contaminated or something. It's just right. like other stuff, like there's spores around. Also, in essence, anytime you make a great thing for a mushroom to grow in, that like substrate is what we call it. If you create a great environment for a shiitake to grow in, it's usually a great environment for lots of bacteria and lots ah, of other things to grow in. So right. you have to be really selective in like what you get in there. Hmm. But on the flip side of that, unlike leafy greens and plants, they're actually much more energy efficient to grow because you don't need to like replace the sun or give them energy and other rights. Uh, the see. core input costs are all from waste. Like this is any fungal system as you're effectively growing, like you're turning waste into something else. Mm-hmm. And so the, like theoretically the input costs are a really small percentage of the total output. So you mm. can make it really cheap, but it's harder to do. And that's kind of why in many ways, why mushrooms are kind of later to the game as far of a, broader part of our agricultural system because if you were right you either for leafy greens as you said you're either growing that stuff outside on costly land right or you're growing it with shit tons shiitake tons of energy (laughs) shiitake tons of energy in, in a in a greenhouse or a um, illuminated. Right. And that's where house. you get all these like really incredible, like vertical farming companies, but they're, they're constantly fighting this battle of like, they automate something and they save money on labor. Uh-huh. But then when they do that, they have like LEDs that they have to pay tons of money into because again, they are replacing the sun. And so that's just a really tough battle to fight. And you know, like, I think some companies are getting there, some are really struggling and it's a battle. Right. And we just like, don't have to deal with that at all. In essence, like that was one of the core things that drew us to this is that like, if we automate labor out, we just get to replace that with like profit margins. Sure. Plus who wants to compete with the sun? Yeah. The you're like, I'm competing with pretty this. cheap source of energy. <laughs> like <laughs> you're like, I'm competing with the sun. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, uh, you know, Mark Cuban just says for that reason, I'm out. Yeah. Like <laughs> we don't, we do not fund any companies that compete with the sun. <laughs> it just seems like a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. I don't sure. Like there's a lot to be said for like, Oh, we're working with the sun. Yeah. And, like we're generating it for like through other no, things. Working, whatnot, but it's like competing against the sun. No, that's competing against the sun. It's pretty tough. Yeah. It's pretty tough. It's a ballsy move. We suggest here on this podcast, try something else. Yeah. And in in essence, right, like mushrooms are not plants for those that are unaware. And like, so they grow on like agricultural waste typically. So we we feed in like straw and sawdust and these things Uh, that are waste products of other processes. Okay. And those are very cheap and very easy to access. And in essence, people are trying desperately just to get rid of them Mm because they don't really know what else to do with them. Sawdust. Yeah. Sawdust. Who knew? Dude, that's awesome, man. Is there some beautiful thing here where you take this junk from another factory and grow amazing things out of it. Well, it's a big part of like what kind of circular, like circular economy or like circle, circle, uh, circular agriculture can be right. Where it's like, we're trying to like a lot of is like, if you think about when we harvest a corn plant, right, we take the kernels of the corn and the whole rest of the plant is huge. Like, I don't know if you've been in a cornfield, but like, uh, d- no comment. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big plant. Right. And so there's lots of other biomass there that we're like trying to find purpose, like things to do with the stock right? and the other pieces of the corn. Yeah. Yeah. And as it, yeah. And one of the big things that's there is like, what is, what is uh, the role of fungus in nature It's to break down this dead mm. plant matter and turn it into something else. And mushrooms are one of those things that you can turn it into, but there's actually a lot of other really interesting products that can be like derived from that same process. And that's like kind of a lot of what we're working towards as well in the longer term. And when the mushroom uses up the waste product, then you, you either have to harvest it or replace the, the waste well, product. Often it turns it into another valuable compost that you can then feed back into plants because it changes like how the nitrogen and like. So some kind of soil, soil like thing. Effectively, it's like, yeah, you can use it as a soil amendment or you can like extract other enzymes from it and then use it as a soil amendment uh, and all, all manner of stuff. And yeah. it's mineral rich or it has other desirable properties to it yeah so i mean it gets sort of nuanced there pretty quickly but in essence like it renders these, i can like, handle it okay these, don't uh, look at me longer like I can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> well it's like you know like, who's this really guy. interested in this of, of the like the cellulose becomes whatever well, else but it's like i want to know chain uh <laughs> things get rendered down into more accessible stuff so like cellulose and hemicellulose are not very and lignin in particular are not very accessible nutrients for most animals, I see. particularly the ones that have one stomach, unlike a cow. Okay. Um, but or for other things or for plants. And so, in essence, if when in mushrooms, what they do, one of the things they do is generate these enzymes that like cr- like break those things down uh-huh. into smaller things okay. that are then much more accessible. Oh, 
And so that makes it when once you've run that process, that makes it actually much more valuable. Sounds pretty sweet, dude. Yep. <laughs> we like to think so. <laughs> so what's where are you now in the process? Like I'm I'm understanding it's funny because I'm in I'm in the car on the way over here and I'm just like, I can't wait to ask this guy how the hell he got into the mushroom business. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it it in retrospect seems really organized and clear. You're like, well, I in retrospect, yeah. In, At the time in, reality, in my life like, it was a lot more chaotic because all sorts of stuff was going on. I had just finished my PhD. I was yeah. like, what the hell do I do with my life? And like is are things going well? I was living in my friend's backyard at that time. And sure. Like, yeah. Well, was, you wanted to be close to the product at that point. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was before the product existed. So <laughs> you were like, I was just living in a backyard. Okay, just, like, <laughs> just doing that. <laughs> I thought you were doing market research. Yeah, we'll we'll call it that. We'll too. call it that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like, I was living in a backyard, not because I was at one, out of necessity. Not well, I was at one with the earth. I see. Okay. Yeah. So you've, you've built this thing. You've, you've, you've raised some money. You're a YC. YC plugs you with 500 grand. Have you raised additional funds? Yeah. So we, we raised the rest of our like pre-seed seed round. Um, okay. And so that went really well. Um, and so now we're pretty much off to the races, like building internally, doing all the stuff that we need to do to make this rather than an idea into an actual company. Right. Um, and, you know, we'll go out for another fundraising again uh, before too much longer. We're So we where does the split, where does the money go right now to build out this facility, which I can imagine is wildly, not wildly, it's, it sounds expensive. You need real estate, you need a facility that can handle this type of environment that's not open to the elements for other fungi to show up and ruin the party for everybody, right? Like bacteria, all those other things. Yeah. In essence, that's kind of what I assumed. Things are turning out to be a lot less expensive than we had feared. So Great. that was a really nice result to have because, I mean, anytime you look at businesses like this, people tend to assume that they're super capital intensive, Yeah, which is always a big downside if you're looking at it from the VC perspective. And the nice thing is like, this actually isn't, isn't that bad in that sense because of just what it takes. You can get a lot of leasing for the, um, for a lot of the equipment and like property okay. and stuff like that. So it's not like we have to pay out of pocket for it. And so when you look at return, like payback time of your own input, like equity dollars, uh, it actually comes out pretty well. What, what's the, what is the near term strategy? Create mushrooms that people want to eat that at a lower price at a higher quality and get them into, do we start with the gourmet stores and work? Our right. Down? And yeah, so you're getting at exactly that of like, what is the trajectory to get to these like broader, bigger impact things in the future? Mm -hmm. And that's where we've kind of identified these specialty or fancy mushrooms. Um, yeah. As the, the Miami term sounds like, uh, listen, man. Okay. I've got my own way about things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's just one of them. the Nicholas crown term. That's the Nicholas crown term. <laughs> yes. So these mushrooms now are headed to the the, the store. Right. So we want to sell to retailers um, and then other, you know, other kind of smaller, fancier things to start. Uh -huh. And then as, cause when, when, then that's why we're starting with those is because they cost so much more per pound right now, mm. just for the consumer to buy that if we like drop the margin a little bit, we can still have a, a leg up. Whereas mm -hmm. if you start with some of the more commodity mushrooms, then it's uh, a lot harder to be competitive right out of the gate. Mm -hmm. And as we go up in size, of course we can have more and more of those, those cost benefits mm -hmm. and go to other mushrooms and kind of expand from there. What's the, is is w when it hits the stores is it under your company's called hedgehog is it under the hedgehog brand are you white labeling it are you so we're working on that right now it's been a <laughs> really interesting journey so we have like yeah. a branding agency and we're actually going to have a sub brand uh that we are going to sell at with our, or sell through in our in our first stores yeah and we haven't really fully built that out yet but it's in in development right um because the premise is like we'll have these mushroom products but then we're also going to have other products that might go into other sectors and we okay. probably wouldn't really have that under the same brand right like and if so you had taco in, effect would be like the umbrella corp of the of these like sub brands sure. is the current model that makes sense right because a, a gourmet mushroom in a grocery store would look in would be packaged and look one way and yeah. as opposed to an industrial input or if you're selling yeah and even among or, mushrooms is like selling like uh like wholesale mushrooms versus like a fancy packaged one yeah like you kind of you aren't really hitting the same art audience you're not going to brand it the same way you're not going to do those like little nuances the same so right. giving yourself the freedom to kind of bifurcate that process is is helpful i mean the last time i found myself reviewing mushrooms in a grocery store wasn't that long ago really <laughs> When was the last time? Yeah, you bought a mushroom. In a grocery I store. bought a mushroom in a grocery store within a year. I was cooking. Oh. I don't know. I was making some kind of sauce. I wanted to add some mushrooms to it. I, don't, I was making some uh, rustic, you know, uh, tomato sauce at home. I For some oh. reason, it's almost always risottos. Like everyone, when and whenever <laughs> whenever the mushroom conversation comes up, they're like, "Oh, I had this awesome mushroom risotto the other day." And I'm like, "What about risotto? Like captured such a large part of the, right. the mushroom." <laughs> 
<laughs> Number one, risotto is hard. <laughs> risotto is really hard to make. It's like easy if you're an Italian grandma. You're like, that's easy. Yeah. It's water and flour. It's like for so me. So are many Italian foods if you're an Italian grandma. Yeah, and exactly. Not if you're, you know. Yeah, a normal, just Italian man. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the, anyway, I'm in the store and I'm looking. There's a wild mushroom mix, a pack. Mm-hmm. And it was like nine or twelve dollars and i just said that's really fucking expensive exactly uh, like i just had that i was like these grow on <laughs> this grows on dirt man what yeah, the hell like, is going why, on why is this so hard why is this exactly. so hard and theoretically those shouldn't really be any more expensive than like the button mushrooms you see right next to it that are like a couple dollars a pound right in terms of like what the inputs are and like the the core bi- the, like the fundamental biology is right and actually if anything should be easier because they can grow without certain phases that the other things need uh uh but the way it's currently done is that they're just like super, like, like I said, manually intensive to grow. Right. And so I'm looking at this this variety pack. Yeah. Also, those variety packs, will, they're they're sneaky they because what they do is that they put <laughs> two like two varieties that are like expensive and hard to produce with like a third one that's not as hard to produce, but then uh-huh. put them at the same bulk pricing as like the the more expensive ones. Right. So like I, I strongly suspect that in most situations you're better served like buying the individual mushroom right they're the cut, pack. they're cutting it with the cheap shit is what they're doing right? yeah they're cutting it with the the medium medium shit <laughs> the mids <laughs> yeah <laughs> so everyone you just heard the ultimate pro tip here yeah, can we get that one more mushrooms, can we get yeah. that one more time because this is gonna go viral <laughs> what of uh the variety packs are ripping you off yeah <laughs> yeah uh variety so packs are ripping you off variety though. packs are almost always like a more expensive one with one or two less expensive ones yeah. that they're then charging at the the more expensive one price point right Dude, we've been lied to our whole lives. Yeah, <laughs> because the growth store. time on each of those is actually really different. Like there'll be like a little pepino in there that grows way faster than a shiitake. And so they're actually usually cheaper to grow. Oh, I just, it's a corner of the grocery store that is now becoming very interesting to me. Yeah, well, that's the, I mean, that's part of the problem, right? Is it's a tiny secluded corner of the grocery store. And like, if you look at our, our global food system, it's like 99% plants and animals, yeah. right? And uh-huh. mushrooms aren't plants or animals. They're this whole other category that we're doing a ton more with. And like at first principles, we really should be because they're so sustainable to produce. They're pretty tasty and like they should be cheap to produce as well, mm-hmm. but they make up less than 1% of our food system. And like, why is that mm-hmm. in essence? Because of all this like labor and this difficult the kind of right. production process. right? And so if that were to be removed, the the thesis is that then it's no longer just a tiny corner of the grocery store. And this is totally the case if you go to like more specialty markets, like Ranch 99 is one near us. They'll have like a whole wall that's that's mushrooms because it's more like East Asian. I see. And it's like more culturally normative. They can produce them relatively cheap over there. Okay. And so then people are like, oh, we have this big selection and we know how to cook with them and it's not as scary. Mm. And so that like is theoretically possible. That's interesting. Yeah, because the mushroom section in the grocery stores that I've been to, it's like, here's for the real, the real aficionados. It's yeah. over here. <laughs> it's not illuminated. There's like people smoking next to it for some <laughs> exactly. reason. It's You're like, like the contraband. Yeah, it's like, what's and going everyone on? says mushrooms and they're like, you started the whole podcast with was just like, oh, we're not talking about psychedelics. But True. people still think that, right? They're like, is that mushroom going to like make me feel different kind of way? Right. Or? Is it going to make me speak to spirits or is it going to make, is it going to enhance my risotto? Exactly. It's the question you always have when you're in the mushroom. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wild adventure. But the, the point is that they're like actually not that scary to produce with, but because they look so foreign right now, mm-hmm. people are intimidated by them. Right. And so that's a whole a whole separate side that I talk with other producers and stuff about is like, how do you kind of get over that hurdle? Well, I um, mean, I, I just feel like we're in we're in the mushroom renaissance right now. Yeah. And there's some really cool stuff going on in other zones where people are using it for like packaging or um, just like different like micro materials and, and whatnot. Right. Um, and there's several other mushroom companies doing, doing cool stuff. So yeah. it's definitely a, a hot topic and kind of blossoming in that way. I even saw uh, this morning an article about someone doing like a, like a mushroom chocolate. I was like, uh, okay. You well, and then there is, I, I do not want to promote products, um, really any products on this podcast unless they pay <laughs> me a lot of money. Uh, but the there's some like tea or coffee substitute that's built. Mm, mm-hmm. We're not going to say the name of it um, because I haven't tried it. For all I know, it turns your teeth funny colors. But well, as you'd imagine, I get every mushroom advertisement under the sun. Oh, at you're this just point with my Google tar- history. <laughs> so I get like, I mean, that's key market research right there. Is just to open up any form of media and it's just like, oh, have you considered this mushroom product and this mushroom right. product? I'm like, right. You're like but that's where people are like adaptogenic and like all this stuff, and yeah. that's a whole roller coaster of stuff that not. Let's okay. So 
let's let's not go right to that role. Yeah, I don't think we want to go there because I don't. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about nutritional value because hey, you've got an option to buy a handful of different products that aren't animal products Mm -hmm. from the grocery store. What's the case for adding in mushrooms? Because for me um, and my diet, um, I am a total savage, um, literally (laughs) red meat, uh, some form of carbs, whether it's rice or sweet potato, keep it pretty simple. Mm -hmm. What's the case to bring in mushrooms? What's the nutritional component that you would say is, oh, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I think first, like mushrooms are nice in that they they thread this nice middle ground between their they can be used as a meat substitute if you want to remove meat from your diet and right. that they fill a lot of the same roles. They have a lot of the same flavor profiles. They have a lot of protein. So that's awesome. There's a lot of protein in mushrooms. Per, per calorie, yes. Okay. Um, which I'll get into that in a second. Uh-huh. But, um, and then on the flip side, they also like, they're not like trying to be a fake meat. They're not like, uh, you know, a faux burger type of thing. A manufactured so, thing. Yeah. And, as, and, and so then there's kind of like the natural aspect, of course. But it's like, so I feel like they kind of let both people from both sides of that equation kind of unify around something that's like, pleasant for for both audience and is is appealing whereas i feel like sometimes the like the true like uh fake meat is like a little bit alienating to people who do eat meat and who are (laughs) savages and i i I eat meat like it's not i'm not like hard against that i'm like you know changing some of those those things over time as things evolve but um but yeah so they kind of they think they hit that middle ground pretty nicely it's that venn diagram exactly meat eaters uh and vegans everyone what can we (laughs) shake hands on it's like Mushrooms. Mushrooms. Yeah, the, the classic meme. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Mushrooms. Yeah, and to more directly answer your question is, yeah, they, so overall they're like, uh, they're not, they're very low calorie per, per unit volume, which mm-hmm. in today's society is, I consider a very strong benefit of a food because usually the issue is not getting total calories into your diet. It's getting healthy calories, like healthy nutrition into your diet without having too many calories total. Okay. Um, and so, and then for, for per unit, uh, calorie, they have a pretty good amount of protein. Then they have a like really rich, uh, nutritional profile of across a bunch of like different, like micronutrients and so on. By the way, really rich is trademarked. So you can't uh, say, you right. actually can't say they have a really rich nutritional profile. Not just a, they have a royalty right. to the, to they have a rich team. or a really rich. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they have, you could say they have a, uh, a quite. <laughs> You could say quite, have quite really rich, <laughs> quite really, ri- really quite rich, <laughs> really quite rich. Totally fine. Yeah. But when you said really rich, that that's like cash out immediately. You, like, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with this after the show. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a legal fight. Th- there will be some invoicing. There will be some paper <laughs> shuffling going around behind good, the scenes. As there should be from any solid interaction. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's good that I was here to see that happening. Um, it's going to pay for the Ubers for the rest of the week. <laughs> Good. Good. Oh man. Well, it's 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 always interesting when I meet people that go into areas that aren't these predictable corners of tech and what's hot and what's trendy and you say, "Well, I'm really I'm really smart. I have a really valuable skill set. Let me through the power of combining my superpower with someone else close to me's superpower." We can create and unlock a ton of value, and we can unlock basically magic in a corner of the world where it's quite meaningful. I yeah. mean, yeah. because your process, I assume if all goes well, your process basically makes mushrooms better and more affordable for a lot of people. Right. If, and if you pull like off I said, this, Whole Foods to Walmart, if you can get them into these other channels, they can become a much larger part of the thing. But I think coming, it's like your general thesis of like, if you create value for someone else, like that's how you actually make money. And in yeah. essence, that's what this is, right? It's like a generative thing where you're taking something that's trying to increase its value. Right. Oh, see, so wait, you listen to this stuff? I listen to <laughs> someone's stuff. <laughs> did, did a little research. You listen to this stuff? He just proved that he listens to some of the stuff, guys. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> great, great podcast. <laughs> Thank you. The, 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 what, you, what you're saying is, I'm not, a, I'm not some kind of, um, uh, rent collecting middleman. I am looking at a, a part of the market where we have this high value product, which is the mushroom, which people know and love. Perhaps they'd know and love it even more if it was more affordable. I'm going to be here to create a system using technology, using robotics, pulling areas that you'd never even consider would enter the mushroom conversation. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this to make things more affordable, more, more accessible because of price. Also, the quality goes up um, and you're revolutionizing a core, uh, maybe not the most core food component of the American diet, but a, a, a good couple percentage points. Of right, it. right. And effectively, ideally transforming it to be to be more so to be more so because yeah. again, looking at it from like first principles, it really should be more, but we can't do that economically right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. And kind of what you were getting at with it, it's like if it's start if it's a high value thing right now, but the core input costs are really low, like there's an obvious gap there. And just like anytime there is such a large gap between like what the materials that go into something is and the output product, what it currently costs, there's probably some kind of opportunity there. Right. Can I just like hang out with you guys sometime and Absolutely. just like talk? Mushrooms? You have to make it to San Francisco at some point. Though. God damn it. San Francisco is yeah, trying to like, kill me. You're just trying to avoid, or like San Francisco is trying to keep you out. It sounds I, like I. It just you know it was so impossible for me to find the right studio. Okay, let's let's take a break from mushrooms for just a couple minutes. Mm, okay, absolutely. and let's talk about another really weird corner of the market and a product that is expensive and very <laughs> scary. Studios. It's studios. called studios. <laughs> yeah, studio space. So, um, there. There are something like I'm going to butcher this number. I know it's 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 somewhere between three hundred thousand and a million active podcasts. Really? In the, wow! Doesn't that shock the living that shit? Does out seem of you? Like, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense as I'm thinking about it, but at the same time, that's a lot. That's a lot, right? So just think about that for a second. There's three hundred thousand to a million podcasts. Now, I would I would assume that about ninety nine percent of those podcasts don't make any money at all. Yeah. Okay. Well, a lot of people are just doing like hobby podcasts. They're so, doing it hobby, yeah. or or they're it's a lead gen tool for another part Other of their business, stuff. or yeah. whatever it is. Okay. Now, n- hearing that number and assuming that whoever's doing this podcast, they have a passion for it, they'd want to invest in it. You know, maybe they're not having ad dollars paying for the whole thing, but you know, they're they work. Uh, you know, maybe they're they're working at the Hedgehog. Um, you know, robotic uh, harvesting yeah, facility, and, wanna, and they have, have a little a bit little, of this little disposable. mushroom uh, podcast. <laughs> they have and... a mushroom podcast. They have a little disposable income, whatever it is, right? There are no podcast studios in major cities. So well, I think what was interesting when we were talking about this before is that, like, I, as someone who doesn't know anything about studios, was like, yeah. "Oh, a studio is a studio. Presumably, they'll have the audio gear you need and like whatever." And you were just like, no. "Well, this one is a is like a video studio, so it just does not really line up with what I need." Yes. And so it sounds like there's like a specific niche there of like what a podcast needs versus what other stuff. One hundred percent. Yeah. So a production studio, it, it falls into certain categories, like a broadcasting space, something you'd see on the news mm-hmm. where you're having a front camera facing kind of environment. Yeah, we don't have the, the fancy news desk here. No, we don't. We, this is We have a white cube. We don't have fancy anything here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, then there is a audio only studio that's going right. to be for well, of course, on one end, music, but also uh, voiceovers. My When, I, when my book... Um, by the way, uh, my book, you'll yeah, see it pretty it soon. <laughs> I could talk more about it later, but um, for doing voiceovers for audiobooks. Okay. Then there's audio only podcast studios, meaning it's a great little tiny booth where you and I could sit and no one could see us. Mm-hmm. Okay. No cameras. And we can wear our best sweatpants. We can wear our best sweatpants, um, our mushroom. Um, you know, our, our favorite hedgehog mushroom caps. Best and sweatpants and worst mustaches. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I lead with this mustache. <laughs> um, and then there's, of course, the most important, if you're anywhere near and around content, it's a video podcast studio. You Not only do you talk, you look into the camera, everything gets filmed. That's how... You can zoom in and do close-ups. You can zoom in and do close-ups. This is the only format that you should be shooting if you're shooting a podcast, period, because it allows you to do a lot of different multi-purpose um, export from the from the pod. You know, you mm-hmm. now you've got a YouTube long form, now you've got short form, now you've got all this all this beautiful great pieces of content. Well, I feel like that's what's kind of unique to you, though, is that like you do this like external like sub snippeting. I mean, like I'm sure some people do some things like that, but like there's a huge focus there, and that's like huge you know, focus. There. Something that you put a lot more in, like focus into, so to speak. Yes, thank you, but. What the idea is, I thought it was pretty obvious that everyone and their brothers kind of doing this now, right? Um, whether you're doing just it not on, in San Francisco, just not in San Francisco. 
<laughs> so we have partnerships with studios in New York and, and in L.A., and we're shooting here in Miami uh, in a local studio, in our local studio in Miami. Now, we have a ton of great companies out in San Francisco, duh, that want to do this. And we basically tried to architect this whole day, and it just fell apart. It just completely yeah. fell apart. So you we're trying to have other guests come in, too. Of course. Yeah. I can't fly to San Francisco and just have it be an unscalable trip. I, I need to talk to a lot of people I mean, to make it, you know. It's expensive, guys, to travel out there, right? So <laughs> It's expensive to be in San Francisco. It's expensive to be in San Francisco, and it's expensive to get my ASS from here to there, right? So. Yeah. Um, you know, I require the finest um, mushroom products along the way. <laughs> accommodation, the accommodation, finest risottos, the that, finest you risottos know, money can buy. Pretty much, you know. So, at the current market prices for these things, it's expensive. Yeah. Perhaps later, yeah, not, my travel fee will I be reduced. So, uh, so well, anyway, <laughs> we couldn't find a fucking studio <laughs> in San Francisco, and we had to cancel the whole fucking trip. Yeah, that is like kind of surprising to me, but like also. I guess LA is going to be way more suited to that, right? And like New York, presumably as yeah. well. So these other locations that you have seem much more podcast media type friendly. Yeah, but you know, guys, we're, we're, this is the United States of America. Like, <laughs> what the hell? You know, and everyone's American like, well, right to podcast studios it's Amer- everywhere. No, it's your God given right to have a video podcast. As far as I'm concerned, um, well, why'd you choose Miami as your base camp originally? Oh God, dude, did you really just ask me that live? A live uh, <laughs> television. <laughs> gotcha. I don't know anymore. Okay, so <laughs> let's segue into what we're going to do about it. Me complaining mm-hmm. about San Francisco. I could complain here. I'm good at that. Yeah. I could do that yeah, yeah. for a lot longer if you'd like an- another time. But what we're doing now is we're building out, and you're going to say, how haven't you done this already yet, you jackass? <laughs> we're building out our own home studio and office and production space. So um, we, it, you guys have to understand, I, I didn't create the Really Rich Podcast thinking it was going to work. Uh, I created the Really Rich Podcast hoping to God you guys wanted to listen to the real the real me, um, as opposed to the um, skit. Qu- the quippy TikTok, TikTok, TikTok me you. um and i would i would only do things i want to do which is talk to smart people talk about business and startups and the wild wild and crazy story yeah. wide diversity there, of those people the wide diversity of those people this is a dream come true for me guys okay but you have to understand that i didn't build this to think it was immediately going to work out right so just to run through numbers you know a studio in a major city costs probably about 250 an hour um you know, I'm assuming we're going to have to front load a couple hundred hours of shows, all this good stuff. You don't immediately go, I'm going to build my own studio. It's just not something you do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, anyway, at this point, it's we're very comfortable building out a studio. Um, so Right. But you have to get to that tipping point, right? And, and that's what you're saying. A hundred percent. Because, you know. Again, uh, we, we could apply this to the hedgehog story where you don't immediately go. Well, we're doing the exact same thing right now. Where we're looking at like, well, do we just launch into like as big of a scale factory as we can? Or do we iterate much smaller first? And that's like what a lot of this stuff boils down to is you've got to iterate through things or else you're going to make huge mistakes. Because no Facts. matter how good you are at the analysis, like you're going to miss stuff and you need to iterate to like figure all that out. And that's exactly what you're describing. Like we went through that with factory. You're going through that with studio. Like everyone's, you know, yeah. really if they're doing what they can, then they're, they're going through that small scale iteration first. Right. Because guess what? It hurts a lot less to screw up when you're renting a studio for 200 an hour or you're still shooting it, you know, at home or wh- wherever it is that you're, you're, you're doing your thing than taking on a 20,000 square foot warehouse and going, you know, we actually screwed something up with the air filtration <laughs> here like, yep. and we're locked in for a 30 year lease. <laughs> And, and then you go out of business. It's not a good time. That's, how, you, that's time. how businesses end, right? Like that's Correct. how you get kind of killed. You do suicide your business into yeah. by by burning a bunch of capital on something that you don't realize you need. Right. It's an unknown unknown. But, exactly. But you know what's not an unknown unknown? That there's going to be unknown unknowns. Yes. So all of you growing mushrooms or making podcasts or whatever the hell. <laughs> Anything uh, in between. There will be opportunities for things to go wrong. And they will happen at all scales and sizes. Make sure you can tolerate it, period. You know, because for me, I'm a I'm one of the most impatient people you've ever met in your entire life. It's like, I want the I want my own studio. I want my own studio now. I want it to be branded, look and feel the way that I like it. I want it to be a reflection of me and the thing that I'm building. And again, it's taken 
it really hasn't taken that long to get there. Thank, which is a yeah, beautiful thankfully, thing. Yeah. Thankfully, but th anyway, that's where we're headed. Okay, so um, we're going to be building out our own space that's customized to the way that we work and our needs, much like the way that Hedgehog is building out a factory that is not just a factory for packages or car parts or brake pads or whatever. I'm thinking about Tommy Boy right now. <laughs> 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 Callahan brake pads. <laughs> um, Right, because I guess that's the when I think yeah, of factory, it's a, it's, it's a whole new type of factory that doesn't currently exist, right? right. So your level of unknown unknowns is just way higher than right. you would have for any, right. any like normal business, right? You don't Google um, for, for in your business, you don't Google ready-made mushroom factory. Yeah, you can't like Chat GPT like design a new <laughs> mushroom factory. Like it's getting close, You'd but be you surprised. Know, not, not quite. <laughs> we won't do that though on on the air. We'll do that after hours. <laughs> uh, so anyway, it, what I'm going through now is. You know, uh, of course, there's everyone under the sun that says, dude, you should open a podcast company. A stu I'm like, you know, I don't want to like I don't want it's a, it's quite frankly, I don't know if it's a good or bad business. And that's why there's no one doing it. Or there's this huge opportunity. Would that mean like running other podcasts as well? Or like what's the difference there between what you're doing and, and to what, open like a podcast business? I am so close to how this stuff how the sausage gets made, so mm -hmm. to speak, yep. that I Love know. Love that expression. It's, it's so great, true. It's, it's so expression. descriptive of exactly it's all the things so you do not want to know. <laughs> it's so uncomfortable. <laughs> but I, I feel like no one, like to build a podcast studio, you have to be a podcaster because it's such a weird niche little thing. Like you, you have to have made the sausage before you correct. go make the sausage factory. <laughs> Facts. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, everyone's saying, hey, you know, you should you should open up this arm where you build these studios and small spaces and and uh, you have this whole empire of a podcast I'm just like I'm just going to build my own we're, we're, and we'll, we'll go from there I, I don't I don't see myself being a the you know the king, the podcast, podcast king mogul, yeah the podcast <laughs> king of uh, Chicago or whatever you know um, because we've already got the mattress king we've probably already got the sausage king of oh Almost, almost undoubtedly. Right. Like, that feels like it's got to be a strong. You're the Chicago. Mushroom King. We already got Mushroom King. <laughs> <laughs> Someday. We, we've, pop, popular, in pop culture, we have the Tiger King. Yes, true. Who, um, you know, doesn't have maybe quite the monopoly over tigers that he might want, but. <laughs> Not as the name signifies. Wow. What a reference. That was, that was a different time in American culture. It was a different time. A, you could even say a rosier time in American <laughs> history. The fact that I'm looking back nos nostalgically on Tiger King is sad. Yeah. Well, because that was also <laughs> deep COVID when we had like nothing else to do. Except just like watch the bizarre life of a of a just a very troubled tiger tamer. Well, yeah, it's not nearly as concerning that it was that, like he made like a meaningful run at governorship of <laughs> a state, right? Or something like that. <laughs> it's like he had like whole digit percents of the state's vote. Listen. If you're, <laughs> to me, there is nothing more motivational than weird shit. Yes. Like when you see the Tiger King running and making a an impact in the, on the political sphere. <laughs> an impact. <laughs> when he is known for a f few unsavory things, we're not going to get into him. Yep. yep. Um, you can definitely Google what he's known for. Um, <laughs> among you know, many, he's known for many things at this point. But you just say, yeah. You know what? He could probably win. It's governor. kind of inspiring. Like it's kind of inspiring because I bet that who whoever you are listening to this, I bet you might have even perhaps better credentials than the Tiger King at making a run for for office. So so you know when you're the world making is your up oyster at that point, <laughs> the world is your oyster mushroom at exactly. that point. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's th these these are the stories uh, that fill me with joy. Um, uh, specifically your story, not the Tiger King story. <laughs> <laughs> well known to spark joy in right. all audiences. Right. Joy and fear. And <laughs> it depends on who you are. Uh, because you say, well, I guess I get to do whatever the fuck I want with my life. Yep. And, and people that's... might just buy into my thing. Yeah. But at least you're doing something that you're like enjoying. And in my case, like you're using the skills that I'm really passionate about to do something that I think has the chance for strong, like, impact right and i get to have fun doing it and kind of in that sense like even along the journey like that's living the dream right it's like if, as long as you're doing day-to-day -day things that you're really liking and there's a future on the horizon that makes yeah. sense to you that is the dream period just fill in the 
you know, open the little Mad Libs book. You ever have that when you're a kid? Oh, man. That's, Mad Libs. Yeah. Just fill in the Mad Libs book. And for everyone who is like not a million years old, Mad Libs is like a fucking. Yeah. Is that a thing that exists now? No. Like, I, Mad be, like, Libs? Digital People Mad don't have Libs, books. Right? Like, it's just like <laughs> iPad Mad Libs. <laughs> anyway, just, just let's forget about that example the, the idea is you get to fill in what you get to fill in the, the blanks here right when when you wake up what whatever that little magical thing is we're all this whole show is a bunch of people that didn't know what the fuck they were supposed to do and then figured out what they kind of liked and did a little bit more of that met up with some people collaborated and created a, a magical idea that so far seems to be working out so yeah, and if it's working do more of it if it's working do more of it if it's if it's not working Set a timer yep. and, and determine when you're going to politely bow out of the race, whatever it is. Yeah, right? there's a really fine line between, you know, stubbornness and uh, just working hard. But yeah. let's actually let's let's talk about that quickly, because what I see what I see that you're doing, it it's unique. It's it's driven by value. It's not driven by ego, because if you're sitting here and saying, hey, hey, Nick, you know, we're eating too much of this. We're eating too much of that. It's my goal in life to make you eat more mushrooms. Right. You're not doing that. Like, that's not the way you should approach it. And like, ultimately, no. it wasn't like we came into this being like, mushrooms are the answer. We looked at it like any business and was just like, Neutral. what is the like economic value of this thing? And what could it be? And like, what are the inputs and what are the outputs? And you just right. do that math. And then you're like, is there an opportunity or not? And right. that was kind of how we got into it. in in at least one aspect, which is, which is to me, a lot more open-minded and less egotistical than saying, I love this thing and I'm going to do this. Everyone else should love everyone else should. Right. Um, Because that's when you find yourself in a little bit of trouble. That's when you find yourself thinking you're right and everyone's wrong. Well, you're just not looking at it objectively anymore, right? Like you're not looking at the, the core facts that other people would be looking at as like their fundamental assumptions going into this. Right. And that's where like things start to break down. But like that open mindedness, I think it's really key to like any entrepreneurial pursuit because coming back to the whole iteration point, it's like if you're not open minded, you're not going to iterate or if you right. do iterate without an open mind, you're not really going to get the lessons that kind of point you in the ultimate right direction to get to the top of the hill, top of the hill. Like it yeah. just doesn't work out. Yeah. So while you have this background in what we would consider higher order, more complicated disciplines, the trick to hedgehog is open mindedness, perhaps an yep. iteration more so than physics. Yeah. So, I mean, like we came into this really thinking a lot of the solutions were going to be robotic. And I think that's still very true. Like that's a big component of it, but now there's just a ton of, of biological stuff we're looking at, like iterating on the, the agronomy of the whole process itself is, is becoming as uh, equally important part of the company to really shape it up into the long-term version of what it can be beyond just like, we're going to build the mushroom robots that make this cheaper. Like there's a lot of other parts that go into it. And if I was like, I'm a roboticist, I'm only going to make robots, then I would just be very stuck with that vision of like how we could do this. And mm. the reality is like, there's just so many parts of it that need to fit together. Yeah. That's a really interesting and exciting way, I think, to close the conversation. Because when we label ourselves as this or that, that's when we might get ourselves into trouble. I'm a roboticist. I, I build robots that harvest mushrooms. No, what you want to do is make a difference and add value. Right. However you do it. Yeah. Right. And it doesn't you know, really matter. It's got to be something useful and good, at least in my mind. But it's right. like, if that's your goal, not build robots, then it can lead you down all sorts of paths. And that's really important. Yeah. Well, look, man, I wish you the best of luck with Hedgehog. This was a lot of fun. Please keep me informed. Yeah, absolutely. If you need a guy that just like has a amorphous job title that just kind of like <laughs> hangs out in the shadows in the, in the factory, like in, in the facility, um, I'm your guy. All right. All right. Uh, an ops guy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, growth ops, Nicholas. Yeah, Crown. Growth ops, uh, social media manager as well. As well. well. Social media presence. Questionable. Is non-existent. In a questionable, in, in a niche, I am just learning uh, more about. But uh, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's this was really fun. fun. See you soon.